The next item of business is topical questions. We start with question number one from Monica Lynn. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason ministers will no longer hold a public session or Q&A as part of the annual review of NHS boards. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. <clears throat> there is no change to the core purpose of annual reviews, which is to hold NHS boards to account. This year, all 14 territorial boards will receive a ministerial review, as well as the majority of national boards. Ministers continue to have separate meetings with frontline staff through the Area Clinical Forum, Area Partnership Forum, and to meet with patients and carers. The meeting with the relevant board chair and chief executive allows for a focused, free and frank discussion on local performance between the minister and those senior persons who are directly accountable from the board. I am clear that health boards should be accountable to the communities they serve. All boards have been required to hold a public session to ensure local people continue to have the opportunity to question their NHS board on matters of importance, and these will have a ministerial presence. I have also asked the Joint Scottish Government and COSLA Integration Review to consider how we can have jointly with COSLA, where appropriate, whole system reviews in the years ahead. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is really quite a simple issue, so I'm disappointed that the Cabinet Secretary has attempted again to spin her way out of this. The decision to stop... The decision to stop members of the public putting questions to ministers as part of the annual review of NHS boards is a decision that this Cabinet Secretary has taken and it's a significant change in direction and stands in stark contrast to her predecessors, one of whom said, quote, I want the public to be full partners in the delivery of NHS services and that's why it is vitally important to get the opportunity to participate in annual reviews. The NHS, the NHS board chairs and I look forward to questions members of the public have about their local health services and hearing their views. That quote was from a former health secretary, the current first minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Presiding officer, if it was good enough for previous health secretaries, including Nicola Sturgeon, to participate fully in public sessions, can Jane Freeman explain to the public why she changed the guidelines and why it shouldn't apply to her? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Ms Lennon is absolutely right that it was our current First Minister when she was Health Secretary who introduced the public sessions, the public Q&A sessions. Prior to her, of course, in the Labour and Lib Dem administrations, that was not the case. Uh, can I repeat, all boards have been required to hold a public session to ensure local people continue to have the opportunity to question their NHS board on matters, question their NHS board on matters of importance and share their views, and these will have a ministerial presence. I don't know, for, uh, presiding officer, how Ms Lennon manages to uh, manipulate that into accusing me of spin. Let me assure you, I am spinning nothing. I am simply answering the question in a straightforward manner, as I did the first time round. Monica Lennon. Well, I could quote extensively, for example, NHS Spife Chair Tricia Marwick, who's quite clear that a new format has been instigated this year by the Scottish Government. Presiding officer, this Cabinet Secretary was previously a board member of the Scottish Police Authority, and because of the scrutiny in this Parliament, we find out that they're a world leader in secrecy. None of us want to see the same bad practices in police governance creep into the NHS. Our health and social care services are facing huge challenges and people need to have full confidence in the NHS, in their health boards and this government. The changes brought in by Jean Freeman will undermine public scrutiny and represent a backwards step. Will the Cabinet Secretary just admit that her decision to avoid public questions is the height of arrogance and will she commit to an immediate U-turn? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I'm not sure what part of there will be a public session where members of the community can ask questions and there will be a ministerial presence comes to a situation of Ms Lennon's accusation that I am avoiding public scrutiny. I, don't, I genuinely don't understand that. I am also deeply disappointed, perhaps if Ms Lennon could just hold off for a second and listen, I am deeply disappointed that in the absence of constructive, positive or even radical ideas from the Labour benches about our health service that we have to resort to personality attacks. 
I will not reciprocate on that. We are not talking about the SPA. We are talking about our health service. There will be public sessions. They will have ministerial presence. There will be questions and ministers will be there to answer those questions, along with health boards who are the subject of annual reviews in order to hold health boards to account. I don't know what more to say on this. Ms Lennon, I'm sure, will continue to want to misrepresent and manipulate these words, but they're on the record and I hope they are clear to the rest of this chamber. Claire Adamson. Officer, um, for the avoidance of doubt, and since this wasn't raised in the chamber when members had an opportunity to do so last week, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm the reviews are about board performance and that the requirement to hold public sessions at least once a year remains? Cabinet Secretary. Ms Adamson is absolutely correct. The reviews are about board performance. What I have said, if you want to look at changes, I've said to boards they have to hold a public session at least once a year. In other words, they may need to hold them more than once. That increases accountability. Ministers will be at those public sessions. I made the point earlier, board annual reviews have changed over the years in order to reflect changing circumstances. I have not removed the public opportunity to question the board or to have a minister there to be part of that questioning. That is why the boards need to hold that public session. They will have a ministerial presence. And can I just add for the record that the follow-up letter to annual reviews, which sets out very clearly my expectation of the board's performance in the year to follow, will, of course, as before, be public. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is maybe more an example of a Twitter spat being brought into the chamber than anything, but I think it's only right, that, and right and proper, that in a parliamentary democracy that ministers and NHS boards undergo public scrutiny. And from increasing parking problems to waiting times getting worse, the public has a right to be able to raise these concerns. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if she'll look at how the Scottish Government can actually improve the accountability, not restrict it? Vice Secretary. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Briggs for that question. I agree with him. It is only right that there is public scrutiny and there's public scrutiny in a number of additional ways. There are two ways I think that we are currently looking at how we can improve on this. The first of those is, as I said earlier in my first answer, uh, that I have asked the joint Scottish Government COSLA-led review on integration how we can have uh, a review of the whole system. We talked before in this chamber uh, with your colleague, Ms. Smith, and others about a whole system approach to health and social care. At the moment, it is the performance of health boards that are subject to annual review, uh, but uh, we need to widen that, and I need to be able to do that in uh, partnership with COSLA where that is appropriate. The second, and again, it's an area that we have touched on here, and that is the whole question of how our health boards um, undertake public engagement uh, and genuine community engagement um, throughout uh, a 12-month period, in a sense, regardless of whether or not they have major changes that they want to take to public consultation. And that work is underway uh, with them and in, uh, in, uh, inside government. And I hope that we'll be able to bring forward some proposals, uh, certainly uh, to make the Health and Sport Committee aware of those, and we might discuss them further, but also into this chamber so that members are aware about the changes we want to make uh, to encourage our health boards to have a more consistent but genuine public engagement approach with the communities that they serve. Thank you very much. Question number two, Rachel Hamilton. Government, what action it is taking to ensure that rail transport performs well during the festive period? Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The member will be aware that ScotRail's ability to provide a reliable service for several parts of the Scottish rail network has been unacceptable for passengers and the Scottish Government over the last few weeks. Instead of celebrating the provision of 65,000 additional weekday seats and over 100 additional services per day following the recent introduction of the new timetable, I'm extremely disappointed to again be speaking about unacceptable levels of cancellations. I've made my position clear to Alex Hines, the Managing Director of ScotRail Alliance, and also to Dominic Booth, the Managing Director of Abellio UK, that ScotRail must take all action necessary to ensure that services return to schedule as soon as possible, and that passengers begin to see the benefits of the new timetable, 
Scott Rail has sought to reassure me of a plan of action to address the number of cancellations. Firstly, ScotRail has already recruited 85 drivers and 54 conductors to deliver these new services. Secondly, an intensive training programme to recover the delays caused by the late de delivery of trains and RMT industrial action is underway. This will continue throughout the Christmas holiday period, allowing a steady service improvement as each staff member completes their training on the new trains and routes. Thirdly, additional expert operational planning resource has been added to Scott Rail's team to optimise the use of available resource and thus minimise cancellations. I've made it clear to Scott Rail that restorative action rests entirely with them and I expect them to take whatever action is required to ensure that services return to normal as quickly as possible and also ensure that services run smoothly over the Christmas and New Year period delivering the benefits of more seats and services on a consistently reliable basis. Rachel Hammer. I thank uh, Michael Matheson for that full uh, reply and for acknowledging that there have been problems recently. However, I'd like to point out some of the issues that um, many people in this chamber have been having and uh, having letters written from the constituents. Last Friday, uh, travel chaos ensued across the ScotRail network and this continued until Monday with over 70 trains cancelled. Many of our constituents exper experienced terrible service, including on the Waverley line to Tweed Bank last week. Trains were delayed, cancelled, and the situation escalated so much so that the trains did not stop at Stow. Hardworking Scott Rail staff bore the brunt of the passengers' anger. Presiding officer, this is absolutely unacceptable. Yeah, Cabinet Secretary, this was the first proper weekend of the Christmas rush and ScotRail failed to step up yep. to the mark. Mm -hmm. Has ScotRail already fallen at the first hurdle? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, um, I fully recognise the experience for some of the travelling public over the last week or so has not been to the acceptable level and the government's been very clear that it's not to the levels which we expect. As a constituency MSP with four train stations based within it, I'm, uh, I, very, I very much understand the concerns that constituents have about the quality of service which has been experienced uh, to date. I've outlined a, a range of reasons as to why it's had an impact on service provision at, to date. What I expect ScotRail to do, though, is to take appropriate action to address these matters as a matter of urgency. And the three elements of work which I've said that ScotRail have taken forward are actions which are intended to address these very issues. Additionally, alongside that, we can see the uh, additional progress which has been made with the Donovan Review, the ORR, uh, will publish its findings on the progress around implementing the recommendations within the Donovan Review tomorrow, which will also set out the range of progress that ScotRail is making in addressing some of the infrastructure issues that also have to be addressed in order to improve reliability on a rail network right across the country. Rachel Hamilton. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, taking the time to tackle this issue. It is absolute priority over the Christmas period. But, you know, I just want to reiterate, we've had the lowest performance in two decades. We've had overcrowded trains. We've got overworked staff. We've got services that are canceled. We've got angry passengers. And now we've got compensation payments that are rising. Yep. Cabinet Secretary, you know that this is deplorable. When will you wake up and realise that perhaps the Scottish Government needs to reinstate the performance targets and hold ScotRail to account? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm a bit confused by the Member's question. One minute she's praising me for taking action to try and get this matter addressed and then is saying, when will you wake up to the matter? What I can assure the Member of is I'm very much awake to this particular issue. But I've also outlined there's a variety of different reasons as to why it's had an impact on performance to date with the late arrival of trains. That's had an impact on training of staff alongside the industrial action. It's also had an impact on the training programme in preparation for the new timetable being introduced, all of which have actually spiralled to create the particular difficulties which you have at the present moment. However, notwithstanding that, I understand the travelling public expect better. And the three actions that I set out in my initial response are the actions that ScotRail are committed to taking forward in order to address this issue, in order to make sure that we get the level of performance that we expect for a travelling public in Scotland. I should point out to the member, though, that some 60% of delays and cancellations on the Scottish network are the responsibility of infrastructure problems, a matter which is the responsibility of the UK government. And as I've made, I've made calls in this chamber time and time again, 
there is a need for us to align the rolling stock provision alongside infrastructure service delivery in order to make sure that it is much more passenger focused and the most effective way to do that is to devolve it to the Scottish Parliament to allow us to put a model in place that delivers a much more passenger focused trailing train service. Colin Smith to be followed by Mark MacDonald. President officer, last month SNP and Tory MSPs united to vote down Labour's proposal to end this failing franchise. And rather than taking enforcement action against ScotRail for plummeting performance, the Transport Secretary issued a waiver allowing them to deliver the worst punctuality since this franchise began. Had that licence to fail not been granted, the company would be in breach of the franchise and the government could have issued a remedial plan notice against ScotRail. Isn't it time the Transport Secretary stopped bailing out ScotRail and started standing up for Scotland's hard-pressed rail passengers by demanding a proper remedial plan from ScotRail, <coughs> showing how and crucially when they will hit the performance targets they are paid to hit, not the two inadequate improvement plans which simply do not go far enough. And will the Transport Secretary join with Labour in calling for a fair freeze until passengers start to get the decent service they deserve? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, as I just mentioned, the uh, update on the Donovan uh, recommendations will be reported tomorrow by uh, the Office of the Rail Regulator, which will set out very clearly the progress that ScotRail and also Network Rail are taking forward in addressing infrastructure and rolling stock issues uh, that was recommended, which is about improving services for passengers. And I await to see what the finding of that particular report uh, demonstrates. There is already some early signs uh, that improvements are in particular being experienced within the Strathclyde Electrics area, uh, where there's greater resilience and there's been an improvement in performance overall, although not today because of an infrastructure failure in points outside Glasgow Central. But since it's been introduced in the course of the last week, the new timetable, we are seeing improvements in performance there as well. And as a member also recognises that the, uh, the, 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 the standards set out within the franchise agreement remain in place. Uh, the waiver is to make, take recognition of issues out with ScotRail's Scott Rail, Scott control that have had an impact on performance. For example, Network Rail's performance, which the ORR have said is now at such a level, they're investigating them for their failure to deliver properly, and also some of the weather incidents which have occurred that have an impact on it. However, the franchise agreement requirements remain in place and in force. And what I can assure the member of is that when you're investing something in the region of over £400 million in new and upgraded rolling stock in Scotland, intending to invest some £5 billion in the next five years in our railways in Scotland. This is a government that's about investing in our rail infrastructure here in Scotland and doing it in a way that continues to drive up in performance. Performance to date has not been to the level that we expect and the actions that ScotRail are taking forward are actions that they believe that can address the problems I've had to late. There are uh, five more members who would like to ask a question. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, passengers arriving at Dice Station in my constituency this morning were notified that the 726 to Aberdeen was cancelled, the 759 to Aberdeen was delayed and the 831 to Aberdeen was cancelled. These are important services for commuters in my constituency. Trains are also often running with fewer carriages leading to uh, experience for passengers which causes discomfort and inconvenience. My constituents welcome the improvements to the infrastructure between Aberdeen and Inverness which will bring the infrastructure into the 21st century. But the question they are asking is when will the train service get there? Cabinet Secretary. So, an officer, I don't know what the specific reasons were for those particular services, but I suspect it was relating to uh, matters relating to crew, which is for the very reasons that I've outlined as to why ScotRail has had some challenges because of the late arrival of the new train types and also uh, to train staff and also uh, some of the conductors as well. Uh, the member will also recognise that one of the key issues that we are trying to address is increasing capacity on the rail infrastructure. By the end of 2019, uh, there will be a 23% increase in seating capacity, uh, but that is dependent upon the delivery of the new high-speed trains alongside the new Hitachi trains as well, which then allows the other rest of the fleet to be cascaded out to other routes, uh, including within the northeast uh, and the north of uh, Scotland. Once that programme is complete, there will be a significant uplift in seating capacity within Scotland and also in the range of services which are available. And the actions which are taken to address crew issues is actions which should help to improve the delivery of these services as the new, uh, the new fleets become available. Alex Cole-Hamilton to be followed by John Finney. 
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Every weekday morning in recent weeks has seen hundreds of my constituents stranded at Dalmeny Station and at South Gyle due to a chronic underprovision of rolling stock on services bound for the centre of our nation's capital. Ali McKean messaged me this morning from the platform to say not one soul got on the three carriage 757 train at Dalmeny. People are missing meetings and shifts. This must be costing the economy millions. This isn't just a workforce or infrastructure issue. Is it, Cabinet Secretary? It's a chronic underprovision in rolling stock. Can you tell the Chamber and my constituents when the rolling stock issue will be resolved and what an effective timetable would meet with his approval? Cabinet Secretary. So there are uh, two areas of rolling stock that the member make, uh, is referring to. One is the Hitachi trains, the 385s, which have been delayed by Hitachi. Uh, there should be something in the region of about 56 of those available to ScotRail for the timetable change. Unfortunately, only 31 were provided, uh, which is a direct impact on their ability to deliver that new rolling stock and to then cascade uh, the rest of the train fleet. Uh, Wabtec have also failed to deliver on the refurbishment of the, uh, the high-speed trains. Uh, they now not, I, I spoke to the global uh, head, president of, uh, uh, of uh, Wabtec uh, in the US last week. They don't expect to complete that refurbishment programme uh, by the end of, until the end of 2019. Uh, the full Hitachi uh, programme should be delivered for the next timetable change in May. And in a discussion I had with the global head of Hitachi uh, just a fortnight ago, he gave me assurances that they are doing everything possible to make sure that they can deliver uh, these carriages on time for the next timetable change. So these are two companies that have let down ScotRail in delivering rolling stock, which is having a direct impact on passenger experience. But I can assure the member that we are applying every pressure possible to those companies to make sure they deliver this additional rolling stock as quickly as possible in order to address the problems that we have at the present time. John Finney to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary, you, you appear to be commending a plan of action to address the plan of action and its shortcomings, which you described as unacceptable, said you were disappointed, and here we are again. I wonder if you've made any uh, assessment of the reputational damage to the Scottish Government by not enforcing the terms of this uh, franchise. You want to take control of Network Rail and you enjoy the support of the Scottish Green Party for that. I think that would be a significant development. Why not end the franchise now and take control of ScotRail as well? Representative Officer, for the uh, very reasons that I've previously stated is that the franchise agreement still remains in place. The objectives of the franchise agreement remain in place. The 1% waiver is on the basis of issues which had an impact on the franchise performance, which are out with ScotRail's control, uh, particularly infrastructure, uh, which have had a, an impact on their performance alongside that of weather events as well. And that's provided for within the uh, franchise agreement and the enforcement of the rest of the franchise agreement provisions is already in place. As I've also stated to the member, uh, there is a provision within the franchise agreement for it to be uh, drawn to an end at an earlier stage if that is appropriate. Um, as I said, I want to see the existing investment we're making into a rail infrastructure and also into a rolling stock in Scotland to be successful. And our focus at this time is to make sure that we do everything possible to make sure we deliver the best possible rail services to the travelling public in Scotland. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Edward Mountain. I refer to my register of interests. Has the UK government apologised to the Scottish government for the performance of network rail, which they own? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator Officer, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, over the course of the last couple of years, but in the last year in particular, uh, the performance of network rail has had a very significant impact on uh, rail service performance in Scotland. Uh, so much so that the ORR have investigated uh, proceedings against uh, Network Rail for their failure to be able to respond effectively to concerns which were being raised uh, by service operators, including ScotRail, uh, to address their uh, issues of concern. When in excess of 60% of our delays and cancellations in Scotland are caused by Network Rail, it tells me there is something very seriously wrong with the existing structural arrangements for our rail service. And the way in which Network Rail is not accountable to this Parliament, to this Government and to the people of Scotland through its Scottish Government, in my view, is a major weakness in how we can deliver rail services in Scotland. And the sooner we have direct control over the infrastructure elements of our rail network, alongside the passenger provisions of it as well, the better to deliver a better service to the travelling public in Scotland. 
And Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And that, of course, is the point. And every time we have this discussion, the Minister brings out the same point that it's all down to network rail. So given the fact that you've quoted the 60% figure, could you break that down, please, Minister, for the amount that was down to weather, the amount that was broken down to broken trains, and the amount that was down to track deaths, all of which, unfortunately, as they may be, cannot be controlled by network rail. Because the fact of the matter is, even if you had control of network rail, you couldn't stop those things that I've mentioned. So if you could split them out so one can understand exactly how much is down to matters that can be controlled by network rail, I'd be grateful. I'm, I'm not entirely sure where the member realises how illogical his question was, because actually a number of those issues are out with the control of Scott Rail as well, never mind at network rail. And also to say that the majority to say that all of these are the responsibility of network rail is patently untrue because I said in some occasions it's in excess of 60% uh, that are the responsibility of Network Rail. I'm disappointed that as a convener of the REC Committee in Scotland that he is unwilling to recognise that Network Rail have a significant impact on rail service performance here in Scotland. The very reason that the ORR are taking proceedings against Network Rail is because of their failure to be able to deliver the standards which are expected within a railway network, not just here in Scotland, but right across the whole of the UK, something that's the responsibility of the Department of Transport. I'm going to have to apologise to, uh, there are three other members, in fact four members, wish to ask questions. So apologies to Mike Rumbles, Neil Findlay and Patrick Harvey in particular. But it's time to move on to the next item of business, which is a ministerial statement on preparations for EU exit. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will take qu questions at the end of his statement, so I would uh, request any members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons. <laughs> 